you join me today in another Rover. It's another R8 as well. So uh, put the kettle on, get your T-shelf ready, because today we're in a 400 Tourer. Okay, yes, I know it's another Rover and it's another Rover R8 at that. But hey, I like them. You guys seem to like them. So let's have another R8. What's the harm in that? This time it's different. It's a Tourer. We haven't done a Tourer yet, have we? Okay, quick recap for anyone who's asleep at the back. The Rover 400 was, of course, the saloon version of the Rover 200. It was released in April 1990, six months after the 200 came to market. Uh, and as we all know, it was a Honda Concerto-based product of the Rover Honda tie-up, and it's built at Longbridge with the Hondas and the Rovers coming off the same production line. Now, unlike Honda, who only really kept the core saloon with the Concerto, Rover wanted absolutely everything from the R8 platform. So we've had the coupe, the convertible, the three-door, the five-door, the four-door, and now we have the touring. Interesting, a lot of these did get exported to Japan later on. And this was Rover's replacement for the Montego estate, because that had been a slot with nothing filling it for a long time since the Montego had been deleted. Well, it wasn't a perfect replacement, because although it's a far more refined car, better thought out and better designed car in many ways, it's not actually as big as the Montego go in terms of boot space. Now here at the front, this is pure Rover 200, 400. Nothing's really changed. We've got the same lights, the same grill. This is the Mark II grill. Earlier cars had the flat front with just an air opening underneath and a badge in the center. Being a GSI, this has got the power bulb, which same as on the Tomcat. Of course, that's meant to indicate that there's a turbo underneath here. But of course, nothing actually comes anywhere near there under the bonnet in reality. We've got the same wings, same doors. And here at the back, we've got the same rear doors as the saloon, even the same tail lights as the saloon. So it's really clever parts sharing and commonality to keep costs and development down. One thing I'm not sure about is the rear bumper. I don't know if this is the same rear bumper as on a saloon or not. I'm not quite sure of the uh, distance per here. In terms of panels and pressings, really all they've had to change is this rear three-quarter, the rear glass, the roof panel, and the seat post and the tailgate. The rest of it is a Rover 400 saloon. Clever Rover. Of course it's a Rover R8 so there's no catch on the boot. It's all either the key or operated by the tag by the driver's feet as always. Now we'll start here in the back because everything in front at this point is kind of the same as in a regular Rover 200 or 400, but this bit is unique to this model. So let's have a good look around here. First off, we've got this really quite interesting load space cover. It's a hard cover, so you can actually pile things on here if you wanted to. to to lift it, it's not immediately obvious what you do, because you can't lift it straight up like that. What you have to do is explore and find this little handle here which pops up, then you can pull it and it concertinas back, either a little way or all the way, giving you full access into the boot. It's not massive, but it is comparable to say something like an E36 BMW, which would have been a rival at the time, although in a slightly different segment of the same market. The tailgate opening is very narrow because we've kept the same tail lights as on the saloon. That does mean it eats into this opening area here. So it becomes, I guess, about two thirds or three quarters of the width of the boot and opens out wider here at the top. So it's a slightly awkward shape to get things into. You can kind of tell it is saloon based looking at this bit here. I suspect these pressings are the same as on a saloon as well, but don't quote me on that. Inside there are little speakers up here, but someone has in this car added a pair of six by nine Kenwoods giving, I assume, better sound. And underneath the floor, if I move all of my stuff out of the way, we will find oops, a full-size 15-inch spare wheel. Also here in the boot is the original radio for this car. This car has had quite an interesting life. It was quite a well-known car in the Rover scene. It was modified quite extensively at one point, but now it's been put back to standard. And this radio will be going with the car and refitted at some point soon. Now if you want more space than just the estate touring boot will give you, you can fold down these rear seats. Push the button on the top, 60% on the right hand side, 40% on the left. Now something we haven't mentioned in a while oops, is the uh, corpse carrying capability of an estate car. And this one is not as good as you'd think. You'd really struggle to compress someone in here if they were struggling. So if you're looking to abduct people, the Rover 400 Tourer is not perhaps the best option. This narrow boot makes it very hard to get a uh, unwilling participant into the back of a car. Now you'll notice there's a light in the tailgate, but there's no grab handles making this very firmly in the retro camp. Now because this is a GSI, we find the same two litre T-series engine as we would find in a coupe. This is a normally aspirated 1998 CC or two litre four cylinder. This is a tough as old boots, cast iron block, reliable as a days long Rover unit, which was used, as I say, in the coupe. It was used in the 800 and I believe the 620 TII. 
is also the same unit that was used in the turbo versions of all the Rovers, like the Coupe Turbo, where it was making close to 200 horsepower. In this application, it makes 134 horsepower, which is plenty enough on a car as light as this to take it to 0 to 60 in eight and a half seconds and a top speed of 124. And in terms of reliability, these things are almost bomb proof. They virtually never go wrong. The only thing that really gives an issue is a little oil leak about here between the head and the block where an O-ring fails inside and it seeps out. It's annoying, but it's not the end of the world. I can live with that. This is nominally the top of the range, so therefore it's ABS fitted as standard. But there is one car which sat above it in the range. That was the GSI Turbo, which was the Rover Coupe Turbo in the 400 body shell. Although they are incredibly rare now. They made around 300, I believe, and I think there were about 13 left. Over the years, I suspect more of them built as recreations than, than were actually built new by the factory. Now I sort of feel with yet another R8, I almost don't need to bother doing an interior walk around, but there's enough changes in this particular car to make it worthwhile having a, a quick look around. So let's start with what is the same. The steering wheel is the same as any other top spec car like the coupe. You've got the same switch gear here on the heating and ventilation. You've got the same lovely clear dials taken from the Honda, Rover Honda switch gear, which is lovely and crisp to use here for the split indicators and for the wipers same little panel of buttons for the hazard lights, rear screen heater and fog lights. And here on the right hand side, if this was a convertible, it would be for the electric roof. But in this case, we've got a tilt slide sunroof, electric of course, and can pull a little slide across there as well, make it a bit nicer if it's bright sun. As with every other Rover, stepping up from the Honda is based on. We've got the nice wood cappings, the nice bits of chrome in the door, all this kind of stuff that makes it feel a little bit more special and a little bit more premium than before. It's a 90s car, so there are no cup holders, but if this had a cassette holder, you'd be completely stuffed. But because this has got just a big cubby hole and cassette holders under the radio, your, ra your cup will fit here quite nicely in the armrest, which is very useful indeed. And as we've always mentioned before on Rover R8s, this has got the king of the tea shelves. If you want to have a cup of tea, biscuits, snacks, scones, sandwiches, nothing beats this shelf area here. This is the ultimate in tea shelves. This car originally had a Rover cassette player, which is now gone, it's now got a Pioneer instead. Underneath that is the 12 volt socket and the ashtray. And over to the right hand side, next to the electric mirror switches, we've got the coin tray, which is a mad thing, which they always seem to have in Hondas and obviously Rover derived Hondas back in the 90s, which is a great place for keeping coins to rattle or for them to fall into the fuse box just below it, if you want to prefer short circuiting your car. Now, a major difference between this and other Rover 400s I've driven are these seats. Because it's the GSI, these have got the Rover Coupe-esque seats. They don't flip forward like they do in the Coupe, of course, but they do have the same half leather, and they call this kind of art deco-y pan Silverstone, and they're kind of a rip-off of the, uh, the Recaro-style bucket seats. They are incredibly firm. They are only a tiny bit soft. They are squishy if you push your thumb into them, but the scorp on the back have very little give indeed, so you're kind of sitting on them rather than in them, even though you are held in place firmly by the arms of the bucket seat. Now apart from the nice steering wheel and the nice seats, this does look and feel exactly like every other Rover R8 200-400 you're going to sit in. It's really only this trim level that tells the difference, apart from the absolute base models of course, which had a black trim here instead of the nice wood around the T-shelf. But this T-shelf is actually slightly out of place on a 95-96 model year car because the Rover 400 ran in various guises up to the 45 from 1990 till 2005 when Rover ended completely. First, it was the R8 variant, which is this thing, which ran from 1990 to 1995. It was replaced by the curvier HHR variant, which ran from 95 to 99 when the 45 replaced it. All ultimately the same car underneath, with just slightly different trim and detailing and different you know, outer cladding really. But the anomaly in that timeline is this, the estate, because this carried on from 1990 to 1998, never got a facelift or an update. 1996 200s, for example, should have the later Mark III bubble dash, as they call it, which is all curvy. And as a passenger airbag. This though has a driver's airbag, which earlier 400 and 200s wouldn't have done with this square shaped dashboard. <clears throat> and the back of the car isn't too hard to get into. You've got the nice big doors from the 400 saloon, so you've got nice easy access. The legroom isn't amazing, it's not bad, you've got plenty of room for your toes to wiggle around and you've got the same kind of knee room as you would have in the 400 saloon of course because up until this point here, it is a 400 saloon. Headroom though is actually improved because the roof line carries on straight behind you, you've got plenty of room up above your head to, well, to have your head really. In terms of fixtures and fittings, there's not really a lot to talk about. The bottom half of the door is carpeted, there's no pockets and there's no cup holds or cubby holes. There's a little ashtray on the back of the centre cubby in the middle and there's a mat pocket on the back of each seat. You get keep fit windows, 
a grab handle and an armrest. It is nice though that being a Rover of the 90s, the leather of these half leather seats is actually real leather. So it does feel really good and it wears very well indeed as well. In terms of safety here in the back, we've got headrest for the outer two passengers, three point harnesses for the outer two passengers and our lap belt for whoever's stuck in the middle. Not getting in this car and firing up is like coming home in many ways. It feels so much like my Tomcat from kind of this point forward. It's just only when I look in the mirror and see that there's an entire estate car behind me that it feels different. The wind is the same from the gearbox to grumble from the engine. Not quite so pronounced because it's got the standard airbox on it still. In fact, with the, uh, I say stand, it's got a standard exhaust, it's not 100% right because the tailpipe doesn't point in the right direction at the very end because of the pattern part. And it's got the standard springs on it. So it's a little bit more civilized than my Tomcat, but it feels virtually the same. So comfortable. So, like I said, kind of refined for a 90s car. It's kind of a feeling of lightness, but at the same time, composure and control. It's a funny sort of position for them to be marketing the, the two litre GSI because sure, they wanted an estate car, but they needed an estate car in the range. But were Rover drivers more the 416 kind of people? When they started marketing this kind of high powered two litre, 135 horsepower, and even higher, the 200 horsepower GSI turbo, were they kind of treading on the toes of oh, BMW E36 buyers? you could have in this, the 1.4 litre K-Series, the 1.6 litre Honda and the 2 litre T-Series. Now depending on what engine you went for, it depends what gearbox you got. The 1.4 used the R65, the other two used the PG1. I'll apologise if the view of my shoulder has changed at all during this video. Every time I open and close the door to start and stop the camera between takes, uh, it does seem to wobble the mounting of it a little bit. So it might have moved a wee bit. Now this car, this, now this particular car is quite well known in Rover circles. For a long time, it was lowered wearing uh, Cosmos BRM style alloys. Uh, it had the, well, it has got the boot lip still added to the rear tailgate and it had Rover Sport bumpers added as well. Uh, a little while ago, it was involved in a very minor bump, and so the owner stripped all, most of the uh, modifications off it, and um, the current owner then rebuilt the front end. It didn't actually need very much at all. New uh, glassware, new grille, and the slam panel had to be replaced, and basically the car was as good as new again. Um, the, uh, the guy who sold the car did keep the um, lowering spring, so it's now riding quite high but it's riding kind of feeling as it should do. But interestingly, it's on the correct springs, but looking at the photos in the brochure, it does look like it's sitting a bit too high compared to the photos. The thing about Rovers is they were all about quality, about being comfortable, about being the best they could be, the best ride they could be, as well as the best product they could be. So they do ride really well. This thing really is just so easy to drive. I mean, this is true of all Rover 200s and 400s. The pedals are just a nice little weight, so you get a little bit of resistance under your feet, so it feels like you're doing something, but doesn't kind of tie you out. This is a gear linkage. Well, this car's done. So it says 97,000 miles. That sounds, feels, that sounds like more than it feels, if that makes sense. But the linkage on this car is good, unlike my Tomcat, where it's a bit floppy and weird. This is tight. You, you push the gear and it goes where it's meant to go. Right, let's see what that 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds feels like. 
0 to 50, it's a 50 limit. That is brisk, this car really flies. This is kind of the dream. This is the fast estate car. This is what practical motoring really is all about. Forget SUVs or sports SUVs, dear me, no. If you need to haul stuff, dogs, family, luggage, camping equipment, furniture, you need a fast estate car. That's where cool is at. And this is what this car is. A cool family hauler for the dad who hasn't given up. This kind of car is just made for these kind of flowing back roads. Now can I put the sunroof back and still have the, uh... no I can't. I want the sunroof all the way open. I've got to have the, um, the venti thing back as well. And with my aversion to the sun, that's not necessarily a good thing. I need my hat out of the back seat. Let's close it again for a minute. This car is the best. It, this car actually is going to be for sale any day now. I think if I was going to buy it, I would probably put it back on lowering springs. It was lowered 60 millimeters before. I think I might only go about 30 or 40 millimeters. A bit more, bit more subtle than that. I'll probably change the wheels as well. Go for something non-standard perhaps. Because these, these kind of wear that look well, that sharp, edgy, square look has aged so gracefully, you can kind of get away. I don't, I don't think you should stance one of these things, that really doesn't work in my book. But just adding a bit of low and adding a bit of nice bling on the wheels could certainly transform one of these into something even cooler than it already is. You see that white Ferrari there? With white, I think this is cooler than that. I dare you to tell me I'm wrong. Because you'll be wrong for telling me I'm wrong, or something. After driving a few Japanese cars recently, it's quite nice to be driving a Honda Slash Rover with the indicator on what I now regard as the correct side, having grown up with that. Well, I would say having grown up with that. Having driven a Rover P6 for most of my driving life, uh, the right-hand side indicators are actually correct for me. Oh, I'm confused now. Well, I hope this wasn't one Rover too many for you. Personally, I think there's always room for one more Rover to creep in. There's always a little bit of difference between this one and the last one. And it's at least a week since I did a Rover. If you like this, please hit like, please do hit subscribe. If you want to subscribe, I promise there will be more Rovers. If you want to subscribe, I promise it won't only be Rovers. So hit the subscribe button and then watch some of the old other Rovers and see if there's any differences that you can actually spot between this video and the last one. If you want to help support the channel and make more videos like this and also, of course, support the ridiculous fleet that are currently being run by this channel, then there's lots of things you can do. You can join Patreon. There's a link down below and above. above. You can hit the join button down below and join the channel, be a channel member. Both of those options get you occasional secret videos extra which turn up ahead of time not very often I will admit and sometimes you get extra photos extra little pointers of what's going on in the background I'm pretty bad at it but I do it when I can remember or hit one of the links below and grab yourself a furious driving or rover sticker or mug or t-shirt which really helps the channel and you'll look really cool into the bargain so thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time driving okay but I promise not a rover well okay I 90% promise not a rover it might be a rover Goodbye.